Boom, ba -da -dum. Howdy friends and neighbors, Banjo Dan here with Mandolin today. We're going to talk about the ideal practice session as it pertains to Mandolin. This is part of the Theory of Practice course, which is a huge course that's all about teaching you how to practice and how to get the most out of your practice sessions. And also to ultimately answer that question that we all have, what do I need to practice? Well, if you follow the course as prescribed, you're never going to have to ask that question again. So if you haven't watched the first few lessons in this course, you want to go check those out, the 11 tips for successful practice, as well as the overview of the ideal practice session. Now what we're going to do is we're going to apply that to the actual instrument of the mandolin. We're going to go through each section of the ideal practice session. I'm going to show you what it actually looks like, give you some tips as we go along the way and hopefully inspire you to practice like you've never practiced before. If you're watching somewhere else besides BanjoBenClark.com, I'd be honored to have you as a Gold Pick member over on the site. You can access this course, which is well over an hour long, plus hundreds of other lessons for banjo, mandolin, and guitar. I'd be honored to have you on board. Let's get to practicing and let's practice good. Part one is the warm-up session. Let's take a look at the ideal practice session and see what we're after in this particular part. 10 minutes is what we're aiming for. Sometimes we have that time, sometimes we don't. But what I like to do when we're in an organized practice session in our place that we've designated for practice, I like to start listening to music, uh, preferably on speakers, not headphones, because I want to hear my mandolin as I'm listening to this music. And we don't have to really be intentional as we listen to that music. It's more of an exploratory thing, something uh, that puts us in the mood to play. And often I'll just start a playlist, YouTube, um, it goes to the next track, and I hear something during my warm-up that I think is really cool and that I would want to learn. And so I take this time, this part one, to also fill in the spots for part five, which is the explore. So if I hear something really cool, uh, Wayne Benson lick, then I go over to my empty 60-minute practice session, and I say, uh, Wayne Benson, and I might make a note of which song it is so that I know... I have something to go to whenever I reach the exploration uh, part of my practice. Okay, next is stretches. So as I'm listening, I'm beginning to stretch. This is really important, especially for mandolin. You know, you might think because it's such a small instrument that stretching's not as important, but, but it is. I have so many grown men with big hands tell me that they cannot possibly do the four finger G chord, right? Um, and I'm always really easy on them because I remember how difficult it was to work through that. But there are six and seven year olds that are doing that pretty well. And the reason is because their fingers have just been stretched and the gaps between their fingers. And uh, sometimes it's some technique. I don't mean to get into a lesson on that right now, but a lot of times people are trying to play a mandolin with their fingers pointing straight up at the sky. Well, you're not gonna be able to stretch and reach those chords. You have to twist your wrist, your fingernails actually point towards your right shoulder. That allows you to reach more. And there's other um, contraptions that we can use to help us condition and stretch our fret hand and our pick hand. We have grip exercisers. Um, and then rock climbers use some devices where they stick their fingers in and slowly stretch them over time that allows them to have more mobility. So that's something that you could consider as well. But we could do these stretches. We could slowly, slowly pull back each finger, releasing some of that tension. Um, I like to also just get my hands out on a table and just raise the tips of my fingers to start working some of the carpal tunnel type um, tendencies that I have, as well as tennis elbow and things of that nature. And uh, we're just trying to get loose, sometimes shake it out um, some people like to do jumping jacks, get the blood flowing, whatever it is to get ready to play. And then I will begin to play in my warm-up session. I'll begin to play and I'll be present. What do I mean about that? Well, I mean that I'm not just going to immediately jump to something fast and something that I like to play. I'm not going to try to play raw hat at 150 beats per minute. I'm going to play slowly and intentionally, um, setting us up for part two, which is a calibrate section, but one of the first things that I do, sometimes I shut off the music, or maybe I just start playing rhythm along, and I'm going to listen to that chop. And that chop, I know what it sounds like when it sounds good, and some days it's better than others. Isn't that amazing? But I'm listening for that, and I'm just going to play through my chop until I can consistently get it sounding the way that I want it to. Then I might try to do some easy scales. We 
we're not doing anything hard. I'm also not doing anything, playing anything that's causing me to have to concentrate on what I'm trying to play. We're not learning anything that's going to engage a different part of our brain. We're going to play and be present on what we're playing. We own the things that we're warming up with. And these don't get old because as we master things, we'll begin to start shuffling more material into our warm-up phase, things that we've, um, like I said, mastered and, and gotten used to. So I will pull out just easy things, sometimes easy melodies that I don't have to think about, and I'll be slow and intentional just to begin warming up with those. And um, Maybe towards the end of my warm-up session, I'll put on some music that's a little bit quicker and begin chopping through with it. I'm not really trying to play solos and stuff yet. Uh, just getting used to the instrument and listening to the instrument. And that's just as important as playing, is using our ears. Does the instrument sound good? Is it in tune? That's important. And are we making good contact with the instrument, both with our fingers and our plectrum? Okay, I think we've covered warm-up pretty good. Now we're ready to start digging into the actual practice session. So that warm-up part can take five to ten minutes, depending on how much time that you have. And you may get into something in your warm-up time that just sends you down a rabbit hole of good productive practice. That's okay. That's what this ideal practice session is about. It's about leading you on. So I say embrace that and thank goodness that the, you know, the intentionality of the ideal practice session took you somewhere where you wanted to go. Let's look at the calibrate part. Part two is the calibrate section. What does it mean to calibrate? Calibrate means to have some type of measurement that's considered the standard, and we're trying to take whatever we're dealing with and make it match the standard. Okay, so we're still going to play slow here, but whatever we're playing, we're going to try to play perfectly, because that's the standard. We're going to try to calibrate everything about our playing to a perceived standard that we want to attain. Well, what does that mean? Well, if we look here at the iPad, I've got a few words that help us picture that. We're going to focus on our accuracy. We're going to focus on intentionality. We are going to note the progress of what we're doing. And then we're going to send what we work on here and what leaves the box of calibration to sections three and four. Where do we get the things that we're working on to calibrate? Well, we can get it from anywhere, but as you practice more and more days using this system, you're going to be sending material to different boxes on following days. So after a couple or three days, you're going to have a lot of material floating around through these boxes. Um, these recommendations here, like send to three and four, send to two and four, those aren't hard, fast rules. That's just generally where the flow of content is going to go. So. As we begin to expand, we're going to maybe throw some things back to the Calibrate box. As we explore, we're going to throw some things into the Calibrate box. This is where we just try to play the lick right, okay? We're just doing our best. It's not the most microscopic level that we're going to uh, take or view on our playing. That's coming up in part four. Uh, but this is where we really start thinking and, and holistically about the mandolin. So we're thinking about how we hold our pick. Is that right? When's the last time you calibrated that? We're going to think about how we hold the mandolin with our fret hand. We're going to think about our finger pressure. Are we playing too hard? Is there something going on that's causing pain or discomfort? We're going to calibrate. Think about all the things that we've learned in the past. Have we developed bad posture? Have we introduced some kind of tension in our arm or shoulders and neck, wrist, elbow? So those are the things that we're going to ask about in this calibration part. And then what I like to do is begin playing you know, the material's going to build there, but I like to play something that's pretty challenging that requires me to play perfectly to be able to get it, and preferably something that I'm going to be using in my playing. So here's an example. I don't have the tab for this, although it may be on the website somewhere, but it's just a D lick that I came across or remembered a few days ago and began trying to work it back in my playing. It's kind of challenging for me, so I'm going to use it here. It sounds like this. can keep going, all kinds of variations. But it requires me to jump up the neck, it requires me to bar a couple frets, and then it's a lot of string changing with my pick. So I can't play it very fast yet. But what I'm gonna do in the calibrate section is I'm gonna make sure that I have it, because what we have a tendency to do is when we almost have a lick, we have a tendency to just call it good. And then we throw it out and it never quite gets polished. 
and this is where we're going to work on that. So I'm going to play it sometimes for two or three minutes straight. And I'm going to play it slow enough to where I can play it perfectly, which is a calibration that we're after, right? Okay, so let's say I've played that lick uh, 15 times. I've gotten to where I can play it at a medium tempo maybe. Um, then I'm tempted, and I think I will, send that lick over to part number three, which is the expand part, okay? So now I've, you see how the content begins to move from part to part. So I'm going to put the next day, I might say the, you know, go flip to the next day's chart and say I want to practice that D lick there, okay? Um, another thing that I might want to calibrate, i um, been working on some forward rolls, cross picking on the mandolin. Okay, so this is a great time to just look at what we're doing. And I'm going to record. That's very effective. Record what I'm doing here, listen back to it. Is it perfect? Are you trying to play it too fast? Are mistakes shining through? Um, what does it look like? What if you can video record it from various angles? What does it look like? If you were watching yourself play across the jam circle, what's going on. So we're going to just work on calibrating each one of those things. And if it's something that we feel confident, if we calibrate, work on calibrating it, and it's something we feel confident with, we're going to send it over to the expand. We're going to start working it into our playing and be intentional in that. If it's something that needs even more work at a more microscopic level, then I'm going to send it over to the audit section because that's where we're really, really going to dig down deep and maybe spend several minutes on just a couple or three notes to really get it. I can't wait to show you that. You're going to love it. Um, but that's how we work through our calibrate part. We're still playing slow. We're still playing very, very intentionally. Uh, we're, we're taking our time. We're doing things repetitively. We are actively listening. We don't get lazy with our ears and just say, ah, it's fine. Um, this is where we begin to really get better. Okay. In the next segment, we're going to look at exploration, which is filled in by some of the things that we calibrate as well as some of the things that we explore. I'll do it in the second B part. <laughs> <laughs>